So, okay, because I am recording, everybody has to use their outside voice. Um, <laughs> I tried to change the setting on the camera so that it picks up everybody's voice. If you have something to say or, you know, just it's an informal, like we always just gather together. I have a, a lesson I put together, but I love hearing from y'all. And I love what the Lord has given to your hearts when we're doing it real time, because that's what we want, right? We want the Holy sure. Spirit to mm -hmm. be moving, not like a dictator sitting on a podium somewhere. Well, I guess they don't sit on a podium, but that would be awkward. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> okay. It does kind of suck, though, when someone says, well, just save your questions till for the end. Because by the time the end gets there, your question is over. It's history. Yeah. You don't have that question anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, um, I've had to shift my thought process with it because if you're coming in and you're doing a, a sermon, like if I was to come in and, and present a sermon, which is kind of is, that would be one thing, you know, that because you wouldn't hear a bunch of people out there and well, unless a big hallelujah and an amen, yeah. but you're not going to be like, so what do you think about the blah, 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 you know, like really come on. <laughs> but a Bible study should be more interactive. We should be talking with each other. We should be letting each other know, Hey, this is what the Holy spirit just gave to me or, Oh my gosh, like that makes so much sense. Or, or I think you're off base. I don't know, but you know, whatever the case is, we're, we're together. This is fellowship. And that's what I hope it is, you know, a time together yeah. and, we glorify God. Well, you know? church, we wouldn't speak. There would only be the one speaker. Yeah. Bible study, which y'all, I mean, if you have some, if you've got a question, I just don't like to wait till the end sometimes. That bothers me. Yeah. Well, an input, I think, um, if it's on subject, if it's on topic, that's one thing. Like, Mindy, if you come and start talking about growing. I don't know, tulips <laughs> yes. on the side of a garden. I, That's right. I might have to stop you, but I you know. You <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't know if y'all want to, how you want to do this, but y'all want to pray. I, I've got a few, there's a few people I know in like the comment section of YouTube who are going through some stuff who have asked for prayer. There's Lori, my best good friend that y'all have heard of, I'm sure. She got admitted to the hospital the last couple of days and mm -hmm. she's been fighting infection. Mm -hmm. Try not to stress, right? Just putting her in Jesus's hands. It's what we were talking about, what I talked about last night. Put him, every, everybody and everything in the Lord's hands. Um, mm -hmm. But do y'all have people specific that y'all would like to pray about, pray for? I have a cousin who is 53. And she was diagnosed over a year ago with cancer. She's been going through some treatments. And What's her name? Sherry, S-H-A-R-I. All right. Well, we know Sherry and we've got Lori. Anyone else? Pacific? My children. Your children, all of them? Yes. Do you want me to just say Mindy's children or Mindy and Tim's children? Mine and, children. Mine and Tim's children. <laughs> we share them. I've been calling them his kids lately. Oh, when they're being not yeah, great? Like your daughter. yeah. your <laughs> daughters. That's what I say to Zoe about Julie when she's being a nightmare. Your dog. <laughs> yeah. How about y'all? You have anybody you want to pray? My family. Coming to Christ? Yeah. Just Wes, anybody? Yeah, my family too. Uh, because of the Lord, they resist. Mm. Well, God knows my heart. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the what verse is it? The heart is deceitful and wicked above all else. Yeah. Who can know it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Good verses that when the time was there, I, I would that it would come to every one of our hearts, just like <laughs> with where it is, the reference. I know Denise is one of the ladies who's going through some medical things. Veronica is another one. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us together today. Lord, thank you for just having this home that we can gather in. Thank you for all, all of our vehicles that brought us to this location safely and that we pray and trust that you'll bring us back home, everyone who will be traveling. Father, we ask today for your hand to be here upon us. Send your Holy Spirit, God, even now we ask in faith that your Holy Spirit would be present with us today, that you would just bless us with this fellowship we come to serve you, Lord. We come to seek you. 
we come to glorify you together, one body in Christ Jesus. And we ask again in faith, Lord, nothing wavering. We ask that you would bless each one of the people here, every one of us, Lord, with family. Specifically, we ask for Brother Wes, for his whole family, Lord, that you would bring them to know Christ Jesus, bring them out of the stiff neckedness, out of the, the stubbornness of heart, out of that lukewarm mindset and bring them into a fullness of a walk with you, Lord. Help them to know what that really looks like and just convict their hearts, whatever it takes, Lord, convict their hearts and bring them into right relationship with you before it's too late. Lord, we pray the same thing for Mindy and Tim's entire family, for their children, Lord, more specifically, that you would stir in their hearts, bring about conviction, bring them to a place where they really want to lay everything down to follow you. And God, we ask that you would heal the places in their relationships that need healing, that you would break down the walls of, again, stubbornness, break down the walls of just hard-heartedness, Lord, and instead soften their hearts, even in this very hour, soften their hearts to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive that life-changing freedom in Jesus Christ, Lord, and that when they do turn unto you, Lord, that all of us gathered here today could gather once more and just glorify your holy name for the wonderful and mighty works you do. Lord, we pray in faith for Sister Aaliyah's family as well, an extended family that through whatever means, Lord, you know what it's going to take for each of us to walk this narrow road, that you would touch their lives, touch their hearts, give them the desire to walk with you, to really walk with you, Lord, not just in word, but in action. And Lord, we just pray that that Holy Spirit conviction fall upon them, even in this moment. We pray for Sister Dorothy's cousin, Sherry, who has been battling with cancer, Lord. You know the situation. You know every bit of her body from the inside out, Lord. I do. I ask you, Father, to hear our prayers this day. Hear our, our pleads with you for a com complete healing to come upon Sister Sherry, Lord, that you would just touch her in a way that is so miraculous that literally when she went to the doctors, they would look at her and say, this is a miracle. And there is no way to ascribe it other than to your hand, Lord. We ask that that would happen, Father, this day. We ask you for Sister Lori. God, you know the infection in her body right now that she's fighting. You know the things she's walked through. God, I don't know why these things happen. Nobody does, but you know. And we trust that you know what's best and your timing's perfect. And God, we ask for healing upon Lori, even now that you would just restore her to the wholeness of health. Take away this infection, drive away the fever, help to restore her to a fullness of health, Lord. And Father, we pray for Denise and Veronica, who've got several medical things that they're dealing with and walking through, Lord, that's really trying them and it's testing their faith right now, God, I pray for an increase in faith in these two sisters. I pray for an increase in faith as they walk through this fire, that you indeed are with them, that you have not left them nor forsaken them, that you would chase away every fiery dart of the devil trying to come after them, trying to convince them that you're not there. We just say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, and we ask for a hedge of protection over their lives right now, Lord keep them spiritually centered on you through whatever they're walking through. And if it be your will, and if it be your good pleasure, Lord, we ask for a fullness of health and recovery to them as well. Lord, we pray for every brother and sister here in this room right now and listening later on, that you would right now sit with each one of us, God, in a way that there is no denying that you are in our presence. I ask that you would do this for us, that we would increase our faith, that we would cast away any unbelief and chase it out of our minds, and that you would give us just the comfort and the joy and the love of the Lord overflowing even in this moment. We love you, Lord. We love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We bless your holy name, Lord, because this is all for you. It's all about you. The whole reason we're drawing breath and gathered together is because of you. So we praise your holy name and we bless you, Lord. And I ask that you would anoint my lips to let this 
message go forward and touch those who you would have it to touch. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Yay. All right. <laughs> I am. Um, Zoe helped me with the title for today's lesson because I'm, y'all know, I'm really bad about lesson titles. I just, for some reason, it'll, what's the word? Uh, eludes me. I'm like, I can't. So thank you for that. And today's message is called The Conquest of Hopelessness. And I read a little bit yesterday during the live broadcast from Charles Spurgeon's sermon, and I have more of it to read from. So it's interesting that it actually tied in perfectly with what we're going to talk about today. And his sermon was entitled Hope in Hopeless Cases by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And this is what he says. Conviction of sin when aggravated by the suggestions of the enemy, some of us have passed through this in our measure and can declare that it is hell upon earth. We have felt the weight of the hand of an angry God. We know what it is to read the Bible and not find a single promise in it that would suit our case, but rather to see every page of it glowing with threatenings as though curses like lightning blazed from it. Even the choicest passages have appeared to rise up against us as if they said, intrude not here. These comforts are not for you. You have nothing to do with such things as these. We have prayed and our very prayer has increased our misery. Even against the mercy seat, we have fallen, judging our prayers to be but babbling obnoxious sounds to the Lord. How many of you have been there? Surely God's not listening to me. I was such a little turd bunny like yesterday or whatever the case is, <laughs> surely he's not listening to me. We have gone up with the assembly of God's people and the preacher seemed to frown down upon us and to rub salt in our wounds and aggravate our case. Even the chapter and the hymns and the prayers appeared to be in league against us. And we went home to our retirement more desponding than before. I hope none of you are passing through such a state of mind as this. For it is of all things, next to hell itself, one of the most dreadful. And in such a plight, men have cried out with Job. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a whale that thou settest to watch over me? When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint. Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than life. I loathe it. I would not live always. Let me alone, for my days are vanity. Thanks be unto God. The issues out of this slavery are often such as make angels sing for joy. But while the black night endures, it is a horror of darkness indeed. Glory be to God. He hath laid help upon one that is mighty, who can make the deaf to hear, cause his voice to ring with sweet encouragements in the death-like stillness of the dungeons of despair. Despair of mind is an exceedingly weakening thing to the soul. I have known it even weaken the body till the worn out sufferer has said, Dave, like David, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. To feel the guilt of sin, to fear the coming punishment, to have a dreadful cry in one's ears of the wrath to come, to fear death and to expect it every moment, above all, to disbelieve God and write bitter things against him. This is a thing to make the bones to rot and the heart to wither. The Puritans were wont to quote the remarkable experience of Mrs. Honeywood at an instant of the singular way in which the Lord delivers his chosen. She, for year after year, was in bondage to melancholy and despair. But she was set at liberty by the gracious providence of God in an almost miraculous way. She took up a slender Venice glass and saying, I am as surely damned as that glass is dashed in pieces. And she hurled it down to the ground when to her surprise and the surprise of all, I know not by what means the glass was not so much as chipped or cracked. So she had said as sure as that glass is dashed into pieces, I am damned. And God kept that glass from breaking it all. That circumstance first gave her a ray of light 
and she afterwards cast herself upon the Lord Jesus. Sometimes extraordinary light has been given to extraordinary darkness. God has brought up the prisoner out of the innermost ward where his feet had been fast in the stocks and years after bondage, he has last given perfect and delightful liberty. Yours is that solemn calm today, O sinner. Rejoice not in it, for the tempest is coming. The whirlwind and the tribulation which shall sweep you away and utterly destroy you. Better be molested of the devil now than be tormented by him forever. Let me beg you to remember that Jesus Christ is still alive. Simple as that truth is, you need to be reminded of it. We very often estimate the power of the church by looking to her ministers, her ordinances, and her members. But the power of the church does not lie here. It lies in the Holy Ghost and is an ever-living Savior. Jesus Christ died, it is true, but he lives. And we may as truly come to him today as did that anxious, as did that anxious father in the days of our Lord's earthly sojourn. Miracles have ceased, it is said. So natural miracles have, but spiritual miracles have not. I don't necessarily agree with that statement, but okay. We have not the power to work either the one or the other. Christ hath the power to work any kind of wonder, and he is still working and able at this very present hour to work spiritual miracles in the midst of his church. I do delight to think of my Lord as a living Christ, to whom I can speak and tell him every case that occurs in my ministry, a living helper to whom I may bring every difficulty that occurs in my own soul and in the souls of others. Oh, think not that he is dead and buried. Seek him not among the dead. Jesus lives and living is as able to meet with these cares of distress and sorrow as when you were here below. So often will it happen that at the first voice of Christ will make the spirit more troubled than before, not because Jesus troubles us, but because Satan revolts against us. The end. Just kidding. No. <laughs> so I love the fact that Spurgeon talks about such hope. He's talking about despondency and the thought that, you know, you've fallen too far or just the moments when we're having weaknesses and troubled minds and, you know, where we're, we're making mistakes. The devil tries to sneak in and convince us that our prayers are not going to be effective. I don't know about y'all, but I mean, even recently for me, I've walked through this, that because I, I had a moment of weakness Later on, as I was getting ready to say some prayers, I literally looked at Zoe and I said, will you please pray? And I was in tears. I'm like, I don't think he wants to hear from me. What a lie. What a lie. Mm -hmm. He always wants to hear from us. He always, and maybe that's the message. Maybe that would be the simple message today, right? He always wants to hear from us. There um, is never a time. And that's probably the biggest you know, lie and trick of the devil is that, Oh, well, because you did this, you can't, you can't approach the throne because of Jesus and what he did. I can't approach the throne. It's not about me. Right. And the Lord knows we're weak. He knows we fail. We mess up. Why else would we need Jesus in our life? It's not an excuse, as I've said before, to sin or to go and live like hell and do whatever you want. But it is a way that we can come back to the father with open arms that he has for us. And not feel like we have to cower in the corner or, I mean, I can imagine if that would have been me the other night and I wouldn't have had Zoe to turn to when I was alone, right? I may have simply passed by saying a prayer. Let's just be honest. If I had felt so weak and so frail in my, in my body and in my spiritual walk that I would feel that I couldn't approach the Lord because of my own sin, because of my own failings. If I was alone and didn't have Zoe to turn to, and maybe other times, even if you do have someone to turn to, there may be this pressing in us to just not bring our requests and supplications before the Lord. But he tells us differently, right? Yeah. In scripture, he says, in all situations, in all circumstances, to bring all requests and supplications before him. Mm -hmm. All means all. So we should learn to bring all. Were you going to say something? 
Oh, I was just thinking about that verse where it talks about how you should come boldly to the throne of, of the most gracious God. I can't remember where it is. I think it's in Hebrews, but like that means that we can come with bold boldness. So like Jesus, like I know you're listening to me. I know you're hearing me. And it's like you won't ever turn that away. So Amen. that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's it. We need that. I need that reminder. Mm-hmm. And we need to be reminding each other of that too. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of times I'm like, I have these moments where I get in my flesh. I get weak. And in that weakness, we're to confess our faults one to another. We're to come to each other and to present these these faults, right? These wrongs, mm-hmm. not for condemnation, but to be obedient to what the Lord's word says. And then to help each other get back on the narrow road. Mm-hmm. There, are, I can't keep on this narrow road on my own. Right. There's no way. I have a Christian friends, real Christian friends. People who love the Lord as much as we Yeah. Mm-hmm. People who love Jesus and, and family, like our families, if they love Jesus, we got to be helping each other. But sometimes that's hard, you know, because our families see everything. And the people we're closest to, they see all the ugly, icky grossness that, you know, our friends even don't see. Oftentimes, I think if we remember that even with our family, with our close loved ones or closest to us, that we still need to be honest with them. We need to be honest by saying, you know, I shouldn't have acted in this or that way. I shouldn't have lost my temper. I shouldn't have had a lack of temperance or whatever the case is, right? Sure. But to go before each other and, and confess, even our loved ones. I, I mean, and then we have to have grace with each other. Mm-hmm. To actually really forgive one another mm-hmm. and to hear it instead of like, oh, you are such a such a faker McFakey pants, you know, or whatever it is that we're thinking of each other. Like, I don't know if Zoe hears me getting upset, you know, and I come to her and I apologize. She could do one of two things. She could have grace and say, I love you, mom, which is thank you, Lord. That's what you do. You know, just I love you. You know, it's the understanding. Yeah, you had a bad day. Things are going on. You're feeling overwhelmed. Or she could turn around and be like, yeah, right. Like, you're really sorry, you know. (laughs) But there's everybody, you know, we have our roles to play in what we're doing. That's important, though, that we do go back. and We do say that we're sorry to those people. Yeah. That we don't apologize to I mean, you know, in families, we don't necessarily, I don't necessarily apologize to them. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying, though, we don't. We just take for granted. You know, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't. Right. Just take it for granted. Go on about our business. But those are. It's important sometimes. Very much. So. It's important all the time. Yeah, it is. And but the the thing where the other person who has been hurt or yelled at or offended, I never yell. <laughs> Usually not at you. But I'll I'll yell, I'll be frustrated about something. And then I'm just like, "Ah!" you know, but it may take me a day. It may take me a few hours before it hits me, before it dawns on me, before I'm convicted of the Holy Spirit, you know. So having the grace with each other that it's like, okay, so I, I trust you enough to know that once you're settled down, once you're calmed down, you're going to come back and you're going to talk and we're going to have a we're going to have it out. We're going to talk about this, you know. The Bible study today, of course, we're talking about hope, right? And I think that that conversation right there is it's hope filled because it lets us know we're not perfect. Not one of us. We're being perfected. Thank you, Lord. But I wanted to look at the book of Judges and the Lord put this on my heart to look at Gideon's story. I love the story of Gideon. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, it's basically the way that I've I've made it out to be a, a short version of it. It's a young man who doubts himself. He questions the miracles of the Lord. He even seeks confirmation from the Lord multiple times. And still the Lord chooses him for a great conquest. So really the title, I don't even know that you knew that, but the title fits just perfectly, the conquest of hopelessness. So what exactly is hope? And the Thayer's lexicon, the Greek word is 1680. And it, the word is actually el peace. P-E-A-C-E, like El Peace. It's not spelled that way, but El Peace. It's to anticipate, usually with pleasure, expectation or confidence, faith and hope. 
And did you know that our faith is a measure of hope? The two exist together. Our faith is a measure of our hope. But the same can be said of hope. Our hope is a measure of our faith, right? I would like to look at it as being two and one. It's basically the same thing. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us, if y'all want to turn to Hebrews 11.1. 1, and when you guys get there, if somebody wants to read it, you just jump right on in. Now, faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Amen. So there's our definition, right? Mm -hmm. Our faith comes through the hope that dwells in us so richly by the Holy Spirit. Our faith comes through the hope. Our hope is given the moment that we put our confidence in Jesus Christ. We're hoping in eternal life at that very moment. So do we have hope in ourselves? No. No, our hope needs to be in the power and might of the Lord. We're going to go on to Judges now. Or I should say go back to Judges now. And we're going to be in chapter 6 and 7. The children of the Lord, the Israelites, were being oppressed by the Midianites. They were so oppressed that they were hiding themselves in dens and in caves and even in mountains. And it wasn't only from the Midianites. It was from the Amalekites, too. So they're being hidden they wanted to hide. It reminds me of Revelation because he talks about they'll hide themselves in rocks and caves. And so mm -hmm. if we look at the the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, you see that this very thing, according to the book of Josephus, was happening, too. They were literally trying to hide in mountains and in caves from the oppression. So the oppression of the Israelites in their disobedience has been happening for centuries and centuries the word of the Lord basically says that grasshoppers for multitude, that the Midianites had come and destroyed the land so much so that there was nothing left for Israel, no sustenance left. So the oxen, the cattle, like they, they basically were like locusts. They came and they took it all. The Benson's 1840 commentary said this. It says, let all that sin expect to suffer. Let all that turn to folly expect to return to misery. It's page 792, volume one of the Benson's commentary. Many Bible scholars can't agree who the Midianites were. I read several to try and figure out just who the Midianites were, and there's a lot of variation on it. Uh, Moses's wife, Zephorah, or Zipporah, uh, I say Zephorah, but she was a Midianite. There are basically the Midianites, they're the ones that hired Balaam, to put a curse on Israel. We know that. So who are the Midianites? And I was looking at this. It, when Moses married Sephora, it was basically the start of a whole lot of trouble between Israel and Midian. You don't really hear much more about them. Uh, they're brought up in Judges, of course, but then they pretty much are wiped out as a people. They were nomadic. I found out they were a nomadic people. So their area, where they tend to hang out, ranged from Mount Hermon to the Euphrates and south to the Arabian Peninsula, maybe even the Sinai Peninsula. The Midianites were officially descendants of Abraham through Keturah, his, uh, one of his wives. They were never considered part of the covenant people of God, though. I started to think about this, and I'm like, you know what? They were nomadic. They ranged from Mount Hermon all the way to the Euphrates, they were violent. They were not ever considered part of the covenant people of God. Could they have been Nephilim? Could they have been Raphaim? Could they have been kind of like the giants, right, back in the day? And I think the answer is yes, because if you look at the Amalekites, who are often mentioned with them, you have the Amalekites. They're considered a marauding people, that word just means they go from place to place using violence, killing, stealing, and destroying. And that kind of people is who the Midianites are grouped into, which is kind of crazy. But especially in Gideon's day, they were considered very hostile toward Israel. Amalek was one of the Amalekites, was a son of Eliphaz, who was a grandson of Esau, which we all know the story about 
Esau and selling his birthright. In Genesis 14, 7, it says, And they returned and came to an Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon Tamar. It is believed by some, again, like including myself and some other people that I've listened to and read, that the Amorites, of course, were giants. And it says it in scripture, but based off of their size. In Amos 2, 9 through 10, it says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Now, of course, there was Og as well. Og was king of Bashan. And Og is also designated an Amorite, which giant. Again, you know, with his bedpost and the iron and it's massive, the cubits, the measurements of it. These people, along with the Hittites, who were the very first inhabitants of this entire area. Again, going back to the idea that maybe these were a giant race of people. Maybe the Midianites were much larger, much more fearful. I mean, the fact that the entire group of people of Israel, the entire family were hiding themselves in rocks and caves, that their whole land was being decimated. It makes me think that perhaps it was something more, uh, more than what meets the eye, more than just, you know, oh, they came in and they, they pillaged everything. Well, maybe they were much bigger at being able to do something like that, hold the people back. All of this was to paint a picture of the immense oppression that Israel was under in the book of Judges. The Amorites were also a nomadic people. So we hear the Midianites are a nomadic people. We hear the Amorites, we hear the Hittites. So all these people groups, and it goes back potentially to Mount Hermon, where the fallen ones came down upon Mount Hermon. When we think about what scripture says of the enemy, this also stands out in Matthew 12, 43. It says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Well, I wanted to look at the word unclean because this is the land we're talking about. This is the valley and the mountainous ranges over there in the Jordan and Israel, right? Today, Jordan and Israel or Palestine. Unclean is a katharo, a karthatos. It means impure, ceremonially, morally lewd, or especially demonic. Demonic. So not only are we dealing with a people who could potentially be this Nephilim, Raphaim, right, fallen angel hybrid mixture of people, which is very possible, or at least a lineage of those people, you're looking at the spiritual wickedness, the spirits, the evil spirits, who when they're killed, they go about the earth seeking whom they can devour. Like that's a real thing, the spiritual realm. If there are these unclean spirits, these demonic spirits, and they're all around this land in this area, then I think it's very plausible that they were also inhabiting these marooting people or these very destructive men and you know of the land. It judges 6 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. We see that the Lord delivers them into the enemy's hand. It reminds me of men and women who are given over to reprobate minds because they don't love the truth. And then we look at Judges 6, 7, and it says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. So they cried unto the Lord, right? They're in distress seven years. There's that beautiful number of the Lord completion. So it was a completion of their distress. They cried unto the Lord in verses 8 through 10. It goes on to say, well, verses 8 through 10, it talks about the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, right? So the Lord sends a prophet and he said unto them, we have reason to hope. We have reason to hope is what the Lord is telling me from this, telling us from this. God's designing mercy for us. If we find he is by his grace preparing it for us, then this is where we begin to see the hope in the story of Gideon, right? Verses eight and nine says, 
that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And then verse 10, and I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. They were fearful fearful and the unbelieving, right? They were fearful. They lost hope. They had seen all these miracles firsthand and they still lost hope. But this gives me great hope because if they, having seen those miracles or their fathers having seen those miracles, telling them to their children, and God still cared enough to send a prophet of the Lord, right? He's going to come and deliver them. So the Lord tells them beyond a shadow of a doubt what caused them to be in the state that they were in. There's no up in the air. I, mm, I'm not sure why all of this horrible stuff is happening, like especially as a follower of Jesus Christ. When we're obedient to the Lord, that conviction of heart comes. There's no denying what got us in the trouble we're in. Right. I mean, we all know when we do evil in the sight of the Lord, thankfully, because he convicts our hearts. So look what happens in verse 11. It goes on. So verse 11 says, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abyssalite. Abiz and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So normally he wouldn't have been threshing wheat by the winepress. It was done in secret because they were fearful. They were trying to get whatever they could for sustenance because all of their sustenance have been taken from them. And so the Lord sent an angel to speak with Gideon, even in their disobedience. The Lord once again has such love and mercy that he's willing to deliver them once more. What mercy God has. This is great hopefulness. And we see how the interaction went between Gideon and the angel of the Lord. I love this. So it says in verses 12 through 18, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us. Now notice here real quick, I'm going to put a pause on it. Here it has, O oh, my Lord. That was just a way that they would address somebody that they respected back then. It was a like a prophet that they would have addressed or a mighty man, somebody that they thought was very important. Um, but then the next word, Lord, is all caps because he's actually talking about the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's, it, I'll go on. So, oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him, the Lord, our father in heaven, looked upon him and said, so I think this was an audible voice. He said to him, go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. He's talking about the literal tribe of Israel here. My family, the whole people of Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. I love this quote. This quote says, there is no proof that a person is unfit for an important work because he thinks himself so. There is no proof that you're unfit for a work just because you don't think you're fit for it, right? And it goes on in Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. Before honor is humility. Now think about Gideon. Right before he's going to go and conquer these people, what is his word? I'm the least in my father's house. You want me to go? And he's questioning the Lord, right? He is. He's like, yeah, where are these miracles? And I'm sure he didn't say it quite so sarcastically, but, you know, at least there was probably a tone about it that was a, like, I don't know, man. And I don't think he perceived that he was speaking with an angel yet either. 
I don't think he knew that. I think he just thought that it was some great man or a prophet. And you know why I said that? Because if you go on, he actually offers him food and cake and nourishment. Now, if he knew he was an angel, he wouldn't have been offering earthly things. Okay, so in the next verse 16, it says, And the Lord, our Lord and Savior, said, I guess, again, I believe this was audibly unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You're going to smite them in such a way that it's going to be so easy that you're not even going to believe it. As, as if one man just went over there and smooshed their finger on like a little ant. Speaking of, i got to ask you about your ants. So surely I will be with thee. What kind of hope is that? You know, Gideon up, up to this point in his life hadn't really done anything for the Lord. Not really. I mean, he heard the stories and he had a lacking faith hear the stories and he had unbelief he was sitting there thinking miracles have passed like we hear today like Spurgeon had said these miracles not anymore physical miracles right even spiritual miracles people will say have passed no no God is the same yesterday today and forever and he said unto him this is now we're talking about Gideon he says back to him in verse 17 and he said unto him if I now have found grace in thy sight and show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So the angel says, yeah, go ahead. Go get your little goodies and come on back. I'll be right here waiting. Gideon didn't know it was an angel, right? So Gideon comes back and just paraphrasing here, he sets the cake and the the, um, what he had made, he sets it on, the, the angel says, put it on this rock right here. And so he sets it on the rock. And what happens is the fire comes up through the rock into heaven, comes up out of the rock and consumes the offering. Because this is back in the old covenant, right? They still had to do sacrifices. And it was that moment that he realizes it's an angel of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So Gideon is told that he's a mighty man of valor. This guy was just back there threshing wheat in hiding because they were scared. Gideon had great hope. And even though he doubted his usefulness, right, for those around him, he pressed on. He pressed on. He doubted his usefulness. And I'm going to I'm going to say it again. There is no proof that a person is unfit for an important work because he thinks himself so. The more we. The more we understand that we are nothing without the Lord, the more he can do through us. The more we're willing to say, on my own, I'm a bumbling, babbling buffoon. The more the Lord can say, well, great, I can use you then, mm -hmm. right? I mean, can you imagine going to the Lord and thinking that you've arrived or thinking you're all that in the bag of chips? How could he use us? Well, you've already, you've already figured it all out. I'll go on to the next person who hasn't quite <clears throat> figured it all out yet. The Lord is looking. Yes, the Lord's looking for the humble, right? He's looking for those of us who are like, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm yours and I love you. What I learned from Gideon, and I'm, I'm thinking y'all probably hear this too, is though we lack confidence in ourselves, we can and should always be confident in Christ. We're, it's just par for the course being humans. We're going to feel like we lack confidence. We are going to lack confidence, but we put our confidence in Christ. That gives us the strength to do all things, right? Mm -hmm. He says I've, we can do all things through Christ Jesus, right? He gives us the strength. More than that, he is the strength. So even after the Lord has Gideon throw down the altar of Baal, like it wasn't just that Israel was ignoring God, y'all. It had gotten to a point where they had built idol, false idols. They had built a tower, an altar for Baal again. And I say again like that, because can you imagine the Lord must just be like, I mean, he must feel that way about me too, though. And probably each one of us, right? Like, oh my gosh, again, are you like, really? How many times are we going to circle this wagon? Like we've already been through this, but here they are building altars of Baal once more groves they made groves 
which was part of their worship of Baal. And that was the first thing that he told Gideon to do was to go and cut down this idol, go and chop it down and cut down the grove. Well, guess where the grove was? His dad's property. It was his daddy's house, his dad's property. So the first place he had to go, you talk about being bold and he was afraid. And it talks about that too. Gideon wasn't like this, this like, Oh, you know, he was, he was timid so much so that they went at night and it even says it in the word that the reason why he went at night was because of fear. He was scared of the, his dad and, and the men around seeing him cutting down their idol. Right. So they went at night and God was merciful. God knew he knew that he was going to be fearful. And that wasn't part of the condition. He didn't make the condition. You have to go at 12 noon, bright, high sun, you know, in the northeastern position. Of, no, he said, go, go and do this thing. He didn't give him all of the parameters. God already knew his weakness. And even in the weakness, he gave him that, you know, that grace to go when he felt led. I love that. In verse 12 through 18. Oh, no, sorry. We already read that. I'm in the wrong place. No, no. I'm in the right place. So, hold on. Sorry, y'all. I lost my place because I'm good at that. <laughs> That's good. That's perfect. That's not... Oh, now you're back? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Recopied. Okay, so it says in verse 37 through 40. Let's go to verse 40, 37 to 40. So it's going to be chapter 6 and verse 36. So it says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, and as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out from the fleece, out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Oh, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. For it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Long suffering, plenteous in mercy, compassionate. This is our God. Did he have to make the fleece wet to yeah. show him, I'm really going to do this thing? And guess what? It wasn't just for Gideon. It was for all of Gideon's people around him, too, yeah. that they saw this great sign. And his, Gideon by now has told them, hey, we're taking the Midianites as if one man. And they're like, what? And then he's talking, he's he's asking for their sake, right? He's He cares about them. He has compassion about them. He wants them to know that God is for them, that he's going to fight for them. By now, you have to think, by now the prophet's gone around and he's spoken these words of the Lord to these people. Great repentance, I believe, was happening. At the time that this is being written, great repentance and the Lord seeing it. And he's moving in favor upon this people, upon his people, because there's repentance, right? They, I mean, finally, finally, they're probably out there cutting down other Baal idols and altars and probably cutting the groves around everybody's dad's house at this point. Gideon asks for more for, I think, others than even for himself. He seemed like a very humble man. And, you know, just from how he was speaking, even, I pray if thou will hear me. Kind of like uh, when he was, uh, who was it? Was it Abraham or was it, was it Abraham or was it Lot? My brain is scattywonkus. Who says, uh, if I find 40 righteous. Lot. It was Abraham? Yeah. When he pleaded, and he kept going down in number, yeah. you know, when we have pleading for Lot's sake. There you go. He's pleading for Lot's sake. He's pleading for righteousness' sake, though. He's like, it's that humility that we are to think of each other more highly than ourselves, and that's what these men in Scripture are doing. When you hear these words, 
he's like, please, you know, don't don't be angry with me. Don't kindle, kindle your wrath against me. And it's kind of like she said about being bold. Mm -hmm. That's boldness to come and say, God, you yes. know, will you do this? Will you make this? Yeah. Need confidence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Either he is or he isn't. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we see in uh, in Judges 7 2. Let's go to Judges 7 2. I would have read just all of 6 and 7, but that would have been all we would have read. Yeah. Judges 7 2 says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. And so, guess who the Lord sent away? The fearful and those who were afraid. He sent them away. And then he says, it's still too many. <laughs> so this is the point where he has them go to the watering hole and has them drink water. And anybody who gets down on the ground and uses their tongue to lap up the water, he sends home. He only keeps the one who get down on their knees and pull it up with their hand, right? Because they're still able to be observant. They're looking around. These are, they're, they can fight. These are ones who are not so concerned with their physical substance and sustenance, if you will, but they're concerned with what they're doing, their goal, right? The trajectory of, of the fight. And so the ones who wound up only picking it up with their hands was only 300 men. So there were like 20,000, 30,000 who were there before. The Lord's like, nope, too many. If we send you guys into battle right now with 30,000, like everybody's going to be like, yeah, we are so good and strong, right? But if I send you in with 300, and do you, you want to know how many were there uh, of the Midianites? I, I have it on a different page, but I'm going to say it now. Judges 8.10, if you calculate it, they had 135,000 men in the Valley of Jezreel. 135,000 men. And how many did God use? 300. 300. 300. And it wasn't just any 300. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hands, and let all the people go every man into his place. All right, so in Judges 7, 10 through 12, let's read there. It says, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But get this, but if thou fear to go down, God knows, he's nervous. If thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say. And afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. So before they battle, the Lord tells him, hey, Gideon, I know you wrestle with fear. I know you went to the grove at night to throw down the idol of Baal. I know that you're nervous. Go on, take Fura, right? He even tells him who to take. He knows who helps him to feel stronger. This is how I see it, right? He calls the person that he feels most confident with. It'd be like he would talk to me and say, hey, Tracy, call Mindy and just say, hey, girl, I need for you to come with me to face this student council because I don't know what I'm doing, right? This is what the Lord said to him. He said, take him, go down and hear what they have to say. Then went he down with Furrah, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. Now verse 12, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number, as a sand by the sea for multitude. It wasn't just the Midianites. It was the Amalekites too, right? And when Gideon was come, okay, this is probably my favorite part in all of this, y'all. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, this is a Midianite, y'all, and said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. And came unto a tent and smote that fell that it fell and overturned it that the tent lay long. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. 
For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. God gave the enemy a dream. God gave them a dream. Not only did he give him a dream, he gave an interpreter of the dream. Check that out. He does that for us, right? That's a gift of a Holy Spirit. What that shows us here is such hope. God can give this gift to anybody. When we say that God can use anybody to perform his work, he does just that. He does just that. Yeah. And what's cool is that it goes on and says, and it was so. When Gideon heard them telling the dream and the interpretation thereof, he worshiped. Y'all, he praised God. He probably sang praises. And then he returned into the host of Israel and said, arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. This strengthened him like no other, just like God said it would. Yeah. He said, if you're afraid, go. And the fact that God prepared him in a day and an hour and a time, the exact tent that his feet carried him to. God didn't tell him which tent to go to. He said, go down. So can we be confident that God sees the end from the beginning in all things? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It was already prepared. God knew. God gave the dream a night before to this gentleman, right? And then he gave the interpreter to be in that exact location. Verse 20 and 21 goes on and says, and this part, y'all, I'm going to say this and then I'll read it. But this part, you have to you have to think. The Lord gave the man the dream and said, the sword of Gideon, that was that was the enemy. Gideon, in God's providence, gave him those very words to speak, to yell out as they surrounded Jezreel. Only God could do that. So imagine the enemy down there in this valley. It's pitch black because there's not a bunch of like light pollution, okay? <laughs> it's pitch black. Maybe there's no moon out that night. And all of a sudden you see this lantern floating. All right. Cause they had pictures and in the picture they had the lanterns. So probably on the hill surround cause Gideon was smart. He surrounded this hill. So you've got the Valley, you've got a surrounding and all you see is a floating lantern. And you don't know how many are there. It's pitch black. And at the very moment that he gave the order they smashed their pitchers, which made a huge crashing sound. In a, in a valley, that would have been like stereo on like yeah. crack, right? I mean, just yeah. like, and then they blew their trumpet. They had their trumpets in their right hand. You drew all around this camp. And then he says, the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. These men who were down there who had heard this dream and those very words were in that dream. The sword of Gideon. You know they're freaking out. And yeah. they did, dude. They went, they scattered, they ran, like they started killing each other. They yeah. did. They yeah. were so taken aback. They were so scatterbrained because of what had happened and how it had occurred. It was the exact dream that this guy had seen, right? Yeah. But can you imagine? Can you like I was just trying to put myself in this situation where I don't care how big you are or how giant you are, if you're in this area and you look on a hill and see hovering lanterns yeah. hovering lights i mean they may have thought that it was spiritual yeah. they may yeah. have thought that like they were about to get hammered and they didn't know how many were around and it was just actually on that hillside you want to know something else cool it was only a hundred that were actually on the hillside mm -hmm. it was only a hundred so really we say that the lord used 300 technically he used a hundred right and so in verse 20 and 21, it says, and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in the right hand to blow with all. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and <laughs> cried and fled. Verse 23, and the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. So after this, they chased the Midianites, right? And they called on the other people in the surrounding areas to do the same thing. And they slew them. They slew them. They even captured two of their princes, Oreb and Zeb. They made two towns called this that are, I believe, still there today, Oreb and Zeb. 
They killed them and they cut off their heads, which goes right back to my understanding of the Nephilim, right? Because you see this with Goliath. You see this in a lot of the giants and things like that, that they would cut off, they would decapitate them. Whereas other men, it doesn't make a point to reference that. It doesn't tell us, you know, hey, they cut off their head. But here, so that makes me feel like it was more probable that these weren't just any men. These were Amorites and Midianites. These were giant in stature. These people, I think, were big. I went on to say uh, how many Midianites were there. And this is, again, 135,000 in that valley that night, taken by 100. And it wasn't the men. It was the power of God Almighty, wasn't it? It was the power of God. I am... Um, did y'all want to talk about that a little? I have some other verses about hope because that's what this is about, right? This is about hope. But I don't know if anybody had any input or questions or anything you want to say about the story of Gideon. Oh, my gosh. I love like it's my new favorite story. I mean, I don't know. It's not it's new, awesome. but, you know, just the, the excitement I got from it. Yeah. And reading it. I yeah. studied Gideon up to. No. I don't really have to. That's not like um, Gideon was not like a big Bible story man in secular yeah. churches or whatever. He just was. I mean, yeah. that's not somebody that they talked about very often. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, I love this story. It's, yeah, it's, I I'm looking forward to just kind of yeah reading this now, like mm -hmm. tell this judges by myself, the <laughs> study yeah. of Gideon, <laughs> getting into the meat of it some yeah. more. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of like Joseph. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh yeah. When I get right down to it. No, I love I loved how it says that well in verse fifteen it says, And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. So like before anything even happens, like he began the battle on his knees. Like mm -hmm. he began worshiping before victory came and that's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Praise before outcome. Yeah, right? You have to, yeah. It's, yes, okay. And that's hard to do. It's mm -hmm. hard to praise before we see a good result. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. hard to praise in the middle of a storm. Mm -hmm. It's hard to praise when we're sick. But I don't worship in advance. <laughs> yeah. May we be taught how to do that. That's like that's been huge on my heart is how do we rejoice in trouble? Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at it. Mm -hmm. I should probably do a Bible study on that because I need help. I don't. I like to think I know, but the reality is when troubles come and when the enemy's pounding, it's really difficult to praise. My flesh wants to crawl into a cave like the Israelites did and just shut out the world. Y'all have anything that y'all do when stuff is like that? When stuff is, how do you get into the praise? Because we're told to rejoice in all situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when things are really bad, how do we do that? What does it look like? comes from an inner strength that you know you have to bring yourself back to the Lord all the time. Mm -hmm. Every obstacle that we have, you have to set it aside and keep your focus on Him. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so maybe that's how we help each other then. Exactly. When we're walking through the darker times, the more difficult, the I hate this life moments. None of us ever have those moments, right? <laughs> There's always a bunch of stories in the Bible about how the small, not the small people, but the lesser overcomes the evil, the larger evils. Yes. No matter, you know, David and Goliath. Who would have thought that this young kid could go out there and destroy the giant. That's right. No love. Yep. <laughs> Nobody but him. Exactly. Nobody but him. Yeah, they were all like, oh, no, no, hey, I you can imagine. Yeah, don't go. Out. No, 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 just stay back. Come on, kid. Yeah. He's yeah. like, what are you talking about? I got God with me. You know? <laughs> you know, the men, you think about that a minute. The men had to be like, oh, my gosh. This yeah. little boy. Get out of here, little boy. Just you know what I mean? Like, you're making yeah. us all look bad. For one. Because they were actually going to see <clears throat> what real faith looked like. We see that nowadays, don't we? And then they probably became jealous of it. So, you know what, though? Oh. Like we were talking about hope. hope. Hope is an expectation, right? So what about when we tell ourselves 
just the opposite. You know what I'm saying? Like we have, you know, we'll hope for something, but we're telling ourselves, yeah, but I know that that's not that's going to go bad. You know what I mean? Like we set ourselves up a lot of times because we'll we'll think, oh, I got hope that you know this check's going to come in the mail or this whatever. But then when it doesn't, and then you're like, well, I already expected that. I I I already knew it wasn't coming. You know what I mean? Self, it's the it's the self talk that is detrimental, right? Detrimental self talk. But to have hope would be to ex have an expectation. But if we if our hope is really inside there, that expectation's really like, like probably gonna happen anyway. So then we didn't have hope to begin with. If there's an, a negative expectation in us, if we're and, and I have personal experience of this very thing. Yeah, I think we all do, but. I remember praying for a miracle back when we got back from Greece, praying for a miracle. God, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I need a miracle. You know, and the reality was I wasn't seeing anything happening and I was not praying that prayer in faith. I was praying that prayer in desperation. I was praying the prayer in anxiety. I was praying it in my flesh, right? I wasn't praying it in hope. And the Lord convicted my heart of that. And he literally one day, audible voice, he said, what if I say no? Will you deny me? That was God's answer to me. But wouldn't that be a form of disbelief? Yeah. It would. It would be. Yeah. And what's even worse is more telling ourselves. Yeah. That I'm hoping for this, but yet my expectation is that it's not even going to work out. You know what I mean? That's not even going to happen anyway. That self protection thing that we have that we do as human beings so that we don't get really let down I guess you know or whatever but that is that that's unbelief it is it's exactly what it is yeah. that's right yeah and the thing is we hope for what is not seen yeah we hope for what's not seen for who hopes and what he already has we're told in scripture that's one of the verses in here who hopes for what he already has we yeah. hope in what we don't have it is it is the end of course we don't have this yeah, the outcome of whatever you're ex expecting would, would be determined where you are on the fence. Yeah. And I think the saying of the world to hope for the best and expect the worst there is completely go. jacked up. That is, yeah. because like, that's, that's it. It's mm -hmm. not the way it, that a Christ follower believes or behaves. Then you would have to question what you're asking for. Am I asking for something that the Lord wants me to have, or am I asking the Lord for something that I want? Mm -hmm. A worldly item or a worldly position, a worldly thing, mm -hmm. yeah. rather than a spiritual thing. Yeah. I don't need I don't need anything but what he wants me to have. Amen. That's right. That's, That's right. Good. That's it. Kind of. Sort of. It's a, it's a refocusing. Yeah. It's not, we're not to be kingdom minded <clears throat> on earth. We're to be kingdom minded of heavenly things, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where we need to focus our lives. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. the whole problem. You know? Yeah. There are so many things that are distracting us. Yeah. And the whole thing of hope, it's not <clears throat> here. Like, this is what we've got to really remember. I need to remember it daily. Our hope is in our eternal home with Jesus Christ. Right. our father yeah that's our ultimate hope when we're born again that's what gives us that it's that hope for what's coming it's the hope what lies ahead i mean we can have hope in things here on earth yeah. but we the main the core and what keeps us from doing the self detrimental talk from doing the believing the lie of the world is to remember this is not our home yeah. this is not our home just you know? passing through right? yeah, yeah. Each one of us is just a blip on the radar. And our job is to shine a light, to be his hands and feet, right? To profess Jesus Christ everywhere we go. Let people see the light of Christ on us, in us, and get home. Okay. It makes all the other stuff seem completely insignificant now, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the problem, the main problem is that everybody out there in the, in the world, so to speak, they don't see that in you. They see somebody that's weird. Yeah. different i'm just saying that that's what they're re mm -hmm. reflecting sometimes that's your beliefs 
But to them, it's strange. Oh, yeah. Well, the things of the yeah. spirit are foolishness. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I mean, I used to think people who loved Jesus were crazy. Mm -hmm. Not not people who went to church on Sunday. The lukewarm were normal. I thought they were normies. No, right. and I'm not, no offense to anybody who's going to church on a Sunday, but I thought the people who were doing that and going on a Wednesday, like the, these were just everyday normal Christians. But then I found somebody who had fire in them, yeah. like Holy Spirit fire. Um, cuckoo, you know, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it because it was real. <clears throat> it was alive. But there's a question that I have. You went to church this morning. Mm -hmm. Yet you can't remember what it was about. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, that's so crazy. I literally walked in here and I told you that because I like, I guess because I was in there and I was just like so focused and consumed on myself. Because when you go into somewhere and you're focused on yourself, like you're not going to get anything out of the service. Not necessarily. It might have been the way the message was sent. Could have been that too. Maybe that too. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't engaging you. As a believer, it was a, it was a. For the deeper things of the Lord. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like we crave that. Yeah. We crave the deeper. Mm -hmm. That's could why be. it's important to have that because otherwise you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're wasting your time going to a church like that. Mm -hmm. Or you should be more focused on it. Being focused on what he's saying if he's a good minister. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had the same thing happen to me. I'd be going to the church, and after I left the church, it was like, um, yeah, what are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Gee, you know, I'm, I'm just listening, but it just didn't register. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was either a failing on my part or a failing on the church's part. Yeah, because like the whole time I'm like, God, open my eyes, help me, <laughs> you know. But. We were talking a few weeks back, remember that sometimes the student outgrows the teacher. Yes. And that happens in, in churches too. Yeah. Even, even if they're a good, like, you know, pastor, even if they have a good message, sometimes we outgrow where we are. Well, especially if the Holy Spirit's working in you and, yes. and filling you up. You know, it's already written on our heart. He just That's right. He just makes it come alive. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of hope, hope. I said, uh, be warned, hope can perish. Oh, yeah. Job 8.13, and this goes kind of what Mindy was talking about, you know, with, uh, with the thoughts. And we hear it in Job because he went through a lot. So, I know, poor Job. <laughs> yeah, this is hard. Job 8.13 says, So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrites hope shall perish. Mm -hmm. So how do we lose hope? Start being a hypocrite. Do as I say, not as I do. It's more than that, though, isn't it? If you forget God, forget God. So start denying him. Start grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, it's pretty simple. If you just, <clears throat> you know, he tells us to seek his face in all things. You know, sometimes I got to remind myself, what has what God gave up? I mean, he, he gave up a whole lot. He even tells him something. He told the Israelites, I gave up Egypt for you. You know? Yeah. Good point. If you want to get home, we just realize what he's gave up for everybody. Everything. Yeah, that's quite a thought. You know? Everything. To I really, get us all back together. Yeah. To get us all home. I mean, really, that's what it's all about: is to get us all home. Back in covenant. Yes. Yeah. Through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm praying, I feel the need to apologize for being kind. Really, I mean, what does it take? Yeah. There's so much for us to read. <laughs> To do that, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, there are so many things that our country and our people, the, the, the United States has done. It's, it's terrible. It, it is, is terrible. And I don't, you know, I can repent for the rest of my life and never be able to be enough. Yeah. 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 Amen to that. Yeah. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. 
and I'll wait until we flip there. I think I just wrote this in the car and we're did you really? I love it. First Corinthians, First Corinthians 13. And we'll be in verse 4 through 7. I didn't read this. This was the chapter. <laughs> Are you psychic? I don't know. Oh, my you. goodness. <laughs> Maybe like one of the dreams and interpretations. There you go. I'll just feel, I brought a card. I brought a card. I was going to write a card. And I messed up. I wrote a card, so I just throw a card up. And I, I, I didn't get a card. A card. Because I must have written it. This is what I was writing. Oh, is that not weird? That's so sweet. <laughs> it's not weird. No, it's it's beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good like that. He is. It says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. We'll read verse 8 as well. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Praise God. Charity hopeth all things. Without hope, we can't have charity. That's what that tells me. We can't have charity, right? We've got to have it. We have hope that we're renewed day by day. Go to 2 Corinthians 4.16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So we have hope that every day we can be renewed. We have hope that there is purpose in affliction, go to verse 17 and 18 of chapter 4 here. 17 and 18. So again, purpose and affliction for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal this is exactly what you were speaking about. This is this is what we need to do to keep our minds fixed on what matters most, exactly. right? Yeah. Right That's here, true. the things that are not seen, right. the eternal reward of glory. And it is a struggle. Yeah. I mean, I like to always say, you know, it's not a hop, skip, and jump to the end. Like, it's not. It's like trudging most of the time. Though there are moments that you're carried through, and I love those moments. Those would be called what mountaintop moments, right? When it's like, oh, there's something amazing that just happened. It's your it's your Gideon story moments. But then there's moments where it's the seven years, the children in Israel being pummeled. But there's always victory around the corner, right? That's what I look at. There's always victory. And there is hope in the calling from the Lord. Ephesians 1.18. There's hope. In the calling from the Lord. It says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. We have hope in his calling. This isn't hope in our calling. It's not hope in what we want to do when we're, you know, 30 years down the road from now. It's hope in his calling. We can hope that whatever it is that the Lord has planned for our lives is beautiful. And I have a few more things to read, y'all. So the greatest of his power, the greatness, excuse me, of his power gives us the hope of his calling that we can know this hope. There's a knowing of the hope, which I love that when it says that in the verse we just read. There's a knowing of the hope. So it is an absolute. And then Ephesians 1.19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? It's just, it's brilliant. God is powerful through and through. We can have hope that we are justified. And that hope, the justification that we have, or the hope of justification, gives us peace with God. Go to Romans 5.1. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
we can have peace with God, not through our own works, not through our own, you know, how well I did this or how well I do that, but it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how we're justified. And so that shows us that it is all our faith, right? It is all by our faith. And our faith is synonymous with, is that the right word, Dorothy? Synonymous yeah. with the word hope, right? So faith and hope, we're looking at it as a dual thing. So justification by faith, peace with God through this hope in faith. I don't know. I just think that it's awesome. And Romans 5, 3 through 6, a little further down says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Here we go. Glory what? In tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope, experience hope. What? So is it suffice to say that somebody who's been walking this out with the Lord for decades and decades maybe has a little bit more understanding and experience with hope? It says experience hope. Well, I see experience as life, walking this out with the Lord, right? I think. And hope maketh not ashamed. Mm, I love that. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Amen. Amen. We can hope. We can hope in the Holy Spirit to be our help in Romans 8.26. We can hope in the Holy Spirit to be our help. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So we have hope that not only is the Holy Spirit our comforter, he's going to be our helper. He's going to make intercession. Prayers that we can't think he's going to pray for us. But guess what it takes? Faith. Hope. We have to believe. No unbelief. No unbelief. We hope for the glory to be revealed in us. This is, again, looking at the future, looking at what lies ahead, striving on toward what lies ahead, not looking back, but pressing on toward the mark. That's what this is. Hope for the glory to be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. And it says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the which shall be, shall be, shall be, shall be revealed in us. Yes, it's going to be revealed in us. And Colossians 1, 5 goes kind of hand in hand with this. It says, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? What? For the hope. There's not only hope that we carry right now, there's hope laid up for us yeah. in heaven too. So hope isn't going to go away when we get to heaven. Wow. And we heard it in the word of the truth of the gospel. Can the word be trusted? Can the Bible be trusted? Absolutely. Yes. Amen, y'all. I love it. It's laid up in heaven. The very word of God, the scripture itself. This goes along with this last one we read. It gives us hope. The scripture gives us hope, mm -hmm. which is in Romans 15, 4. I love this. I love it all. I probably should stop saying I love this because like, oh, my goodness. Tracy just loves everything. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Romans 15, 4. No reason not to. There you go. It says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What? Oh. Isn't that good? Y'all that. OK, so comfort of the scriptures. There's comfort in the word of God. The word of God gives us hope. It's for our learning that through patience, through patience, it takes time sometimes to understand the word of God. It takes time sometimes to, to know what, what he's talking about or how to 
how to put it to our lives and, and let it apply. It's kind of like a, it's like a icy hot or Bengay or, you know, one of those creams that the ones that gets really burny feeling and then cools down. It's kind of like that. Like it's the healing balm. It's Gilead's balm, right? It, it, which we'll have to read that too next time maybe, but it is this incredible thing that the word of God, right? When we learn how to apply it in just the right places for just the right situations, for just the right pains, it heals a multitude. It goes deep. It, it sticks with us. And it's not like something that just comes at once, which is why I believe the word right here says through patience. Yeah. It's going to take time. We are not going to know it all today. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have more growth to do, more learning. Lord knows I've got lots of learning to do. Lots of when I grow up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I want to be pleasing unto the Lord. Like, may that be the cry of all of our children's hearts, you know, all of the young people's hearts. When I grow up, I want to please our Heavenly Father mm -hmm. and ours too. Like, each one of us is still a child. Do we understand that? Like, you're, you're a daughter of a king. You're a son of a king. You know, I mean, we have a daddy. We call him Abba. Abba yeah. is a loving term abba is like literally running into our dad's arms and him throwing us up in the air and catching us right abba father and we have this hope this great hope that he gives to us we are saved by hope romans 8 24 through 28 it says for we are saved by hope and this is what we were saying earlier but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience. There it is again. Wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Not according to you and me and what we want, according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. So people need to stop taking that out of context. Yeah. You know, things don't work together for the good of everybody in the world. No, no, no. Read on. For them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. And so for people to be out there living sinful lives fornicating, lying, cheating, stealing, um, committing adultery, getting drunk, for people to be out there living in sin and quoting a verse like this, yeah. it's blasphemous. Yes. That's not what it says. That's the devil mm -hmm. in the details, isn't it? That's him, kind of your question last night, right? Mm -hmm. That's a false teacher. That's somebody who's only giving half truths. It's just like, here's a little snippet of what the word, to make you feel good in your sin. That's what the, the churches I went to, yes. that's what they did for me. It was a whole lot of half-truths, a whole lot of snippets of the word of God. But it was all the feel-good, cozy, it's a, I'm comfortable in my sin when I left there at the end of a Sunday. Yep. And God convicted my heart. Hallelujah. Yep. Right? He convicts our hearts. But the only way to be convicted is to know what sin is. And there are so many people out there who are not preaching what sin is. And thereby, they're guilty. They're a false shepherd. They're leading their flocks to the pits of hell by not letting the Holy Spirit convict their heart with the word of God. Where's conviction? It comes through the preaching of the law, the teaching of the word of God, right? It's, it is talking about the commandments of God. We should. We should be like, hey, um, yeah, so you just got those new pair of Nike shoes and you just told me that you stole them. Um, yeah, that's not okay. That's a sin, you know, and nobody's saying it, though. Everybody's just like, oh, do do do, nice shoes. And there's never a conversation happening. Or, I mean, I don't know. It's hard. Like you were saying, it's hard sometimes to start up conversations with people of the world and in the world because they're so blinded by the pleasures of this life. Yeah. Yeah, that makes us 
so strange to me. Yes. We're peculiar. Yeah, we are so peculiar. And I'm glad I am. Yeah, yeah. me too. I'm glad I am too. So and we know that being peculiar is a great thing. They just think being peculiar is not such a great thing. So maybe the prayer that we all could be praying together, like collectively, is that the Lord would open doors for each one of us with with people who we encounter. Like put somebody in front of our paths at least once a week until we meet again. At least each one of us. That would be two, yeah. four, six, what, seven? Yeah. So seven people every week. And if we meet in three or four weeks or however long it is, then how many people's lives could we potentially affect? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, so maybe that would be the prayer is that Lord put somebody in our paths that Soften, even now, soften their hearts, prepare their hearts to receive the word. I, I feel like maybe if we're praying that, we'd have a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, so many are just like... Closed off. Yeah. They don't want to be inconvenienced because they're living their life. And if, <laughs> if I have to do what the Lord wants me to do, then I'm going to have to make changes in my life. And I don't want to make changes in my life because I'm happy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, it is exactly. And you've got the whole world telling them that their sin, their sin's not sin. Yeah. yeah. So you true. have all all the stuff going on in the world where what they're doing trying to sin. So what we're saying, we're what's wrong with you, Mindy? You know what I mean? Why would you think this is sin? You know, the preacher said that none of that was sin. You know, so it, it, we are in a real strange position any anymore because everything that. They're telling everybody that all these sins are, are sins. Yeah. Or they're saying, once saved, always saved. Exactly. So, hey, you were born again. You're good to go from here on out until yeah. the moment you enter heaven. Yeah. That's yeah. dangerous. That's too many years. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, our friends and family really think it's all about just living your best life. Just, you know, and, and that's being blessed. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got a new truck. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm waiting for the rapture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which I think that it's appealing to the flesh, right? The whole rapture doctrine, it is appealing to the flesh. I'm sure. the first to admit it. Really to get whooped out of here yeah. before anything really, really bad ever happens yeah, on absolutely. earth. Absolutely. Please wouldn't, sign me who up. Who would have won on that? On that though, yeah, airplane. Point. Uh, you know what I mean? I see For this sure. one preacher. He says that uh, they're going to make scandals. Mm. Okay. For everybody that gets left behind, they can go to these So they will tell them what to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're going to need, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's pretty funny. All right, y'all. I have just a couple more, a couple more to read here. So, um, Second Corinthians eleven three. What? You telling me to talk loud? <laughs> but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity here means singleness. It means mental honesty. I didn't know simplicity meant mental honesty, but it does. The virtue of one who is free from pretense and hypocrisy. Free from hypocrisy. Not self-seeking. Openness of heart manifesting itself by generosity. Well, I never really understood that. That word is way more than what I understand simplicity to be, again, in the human language, in the, well, in the English language, human language, in the English language. It means free from pretense and hypocrisy, not self-seeking, manifesting itself by generosity. So again, the word says, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So there is a singleness in Christ Jesus there is free from hypocrisy. There's no hypocrisy in Jesus Christ. There is generosity in him, sincerity, mental. I mean, it's just amazing, right? And 2 Corinthians 3.12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. So if we have such hope, we need to use plainness of speech, right? What is that? Plainness is parasia. And get this. 
freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech. This is where we get freedom of speech, like our forefathers wrote in the Constitution. This is freedom of speech. It originates and stems from something that is God-given, and that's why they put it in there, that no man may take it away. So if we have great plainness of speech as it pertains to the word of God, like we're talking about with sharing it with other people, we share it with boldness and with confidence because we have this hope in us. We can't help but share it with others. So they know that this hope exists. Hope lets us rejoice. The hope in us is what actually allows us to have any kind of rejoicing. And in Romans 12, 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. There we go again with the patience, right? Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. This is the hope of all of us. It's salvation. It's eternal life with Jesus. And we have a hope of the Lord fulfilling all things, everything that he's ever written, everything he's ever said he will fulfill. And we can be confident in that. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Don't you waver. Hope is lively. This is probably my favorite one. What? (laughs) Hope is lively. And we'll go to 1 Peter 1.3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Hope is lively by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto a lively hope. This word lively is 2198 in the Greek. It means to live, to breathe, to be among the living, not lifeless, not dead, to enjoy real life, to have true life and worthy of the name an active life, endless in the kingdom of God to live. In the manner of living and acting, of morals and characters, living water. That's one of the definitions of this word, a lively hope. Having vital power in itself and exerting the same upon the soul. To be full, in full vigor, to be fresh, strong, efficient, as well as powerful, active, and efficacious. Lively. That is quite a word. It's a big word. So... Our hope is expectation, but it's also confidence. Our hope is expectation, but we've got to have a confidence in Christ. Confident expectation. There you go. Confident hope. We can be confident in our hope in the Lord because he is our hope. It's so simple, right? We can have hope because the hope, the word of glory is our hope. There you go. So we have hope. All decisions belong into the Lord. That's another thing that's really awesome, that we don't have to be concerned about the way things will turn out or how things are going to be or how they're going to go. We don't have to get seven days down the road or seven months down the road from right now because the Lord has seen it all and he knows how everything will turn out. He knows the way that we should go. He'll lead us in the straight paths if we'll just let him. That's the hard part. The hard part is taking your hand off of something and asking the Lord to guide us so that it's really him leading us, not us leading ourselves. And so in Romans 9, 15 through 16, it says, and this is part of all decisions belong to the Lord. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Oh, no. That's a good one, too. But let's go to 9. <laughs> 9, 15 and 16. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion, on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. (coughs) Little Tracy, doesn't matter what you think. It matters what I think, right? You wouldn't show mercy, but I am. You wouldn't walk that way. I do. And and whose way matters? Not my way. His way matters. I want to know his ways. I want to go his ways. 
So I love that verse because it reminds me of that very thing. God will have mercy on who he has mercy. He'll com have compassion on who he has compassion. Don't either, you know, myself or any of y'all, we don't need to get in that position, in that place where we're judge and jury, basically. Yeah. You know? Right, right. That's and that's a that's a temptation when yeah. we get angry yeah. and frustrated or hurt. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to have like really kind thoughts, but it says that in scripture too. For even the even the enemies love those who are of their own. Right. They love their friends. They love their buddies. Right. But Jesus says, "I'm calling you to love your enemies." Right. That's hard. You know, it'll heat burning coals upon their head. Yeah. That's what he says. And how many of us have seen that in action in our own lives? Yeah. Yeah. That it really, you want to make an enemy furious, love them. Yeah. <laughs> love them. And it's not that that's our goal. Our goal is to be Christ-like. Our goal is to do what we're commanded to do. But it blows my mind how angry people get when we're faced with persecution, when people hate us for righteousness sake. There are a handful of times I can say I, I remember for certain that that was what was taking place. And she called me a liar and some other things that were not nice. And praise God, that was one of the times you guys know how loud Zoe is and how vocal she is. Um, <laughs> so this is one time in front of Zoe, this woman says these things and was accusing me. And Zoe said, excuse me, may I say something? And we're like, yeah. And she said, my mom may be a lot of things, but a liar is not one of them. And I've never felt more, oh, in my heart, you know what I mean? Because, wow, you know? Yeah. And I knew in that moment that this lady was persecuting me for righteousness sake. Mm -hmm. I knew. And I knew that I had to rise above it. And I'll tell you, though, it was only by the hand of angels. Because in old Tracy, I probably would have kicked her in her shins. <laughs> she was right in front of me. I was standing and she was sitting. I could have, I mean... Clear shot. But that thought didn't even cross my mind. What crossed my mind is what has happened so wrong to you? What has happened in your life to make you hate being loved by a professing Christian that you are, right? Like what had to have happened in this person's life? Mm -hmm. We rejoice. We're patient in tribulation. Instant in prayer. Eternal life with Jesus. We have hope. Like we talked about of the Lord fulfilling everything that he said that he's going to do. We've talked about hope being lively. I love that so much. Again, we talked about he's going to have mercy on who he has mercy, compassion on who he has compassion. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And that kind of goes along with the story I just told, right? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. We don't have to buy the lie that somehow we need to take take vengeance for the wrongs done to us. We don't have to buy that lie. It's not our place. It's above our pay grade. And we will make a mess of it anyway. Yeah. We will. The Lord will do his justice and seek vengeance on those that need vengeance to be had, right? He'll do it in a way that will bring about real change, that will bring about actual conviction of heart that will bring people, Lord willing, to a place of repentance and a closer walk with him. Whereas if we did it, yeah. it'd just be a big fight. Yeah. It'd be a big war. Our loved ones, our friends, the people that we see who aren't walking with the Lord in obedience, we don't want to go to war. It would hurt us more than it would them. Yeah. Because you have to live with what you've just done and ask forgiveness. That's right. Yeah. Romans uh, 12, 19, because God sees everything. All right. He sees every wrong done to every one of us. Mm -hmm. He hears every wrong word spoken about every one of us. He sees it all. He knows it all. And in Romans 12, 19, he says, dearly beloved, 
avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay it, saith the Lord. We don't have to wonder, well, is he going to, uh, you know, does he care? Yeah, his word says so. And if we believe his word, then yes, he'll take care of it in his timing, in his way, by his means. Not you and me and, and Sally to body out there or whoever else. But <laughs> Romans 15, 13 goes on to say, now the hope, now the God of hope. So our God is a God of hope. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So the, the Holy Ghost wants us to abound in hope. And what does abounding look like? The word abound is perusio. It's a thing which comes in abundance. It overflows unto one. Something falls to the lot of one in a large measure. It's excel to be over, to furnish one richly so that he has abundance. So through the power of the Holy Ghost, right? We're going to abound in hope. I love it. Overflow. Overflow. I want to end with uh, just some final words from Spurgeon from that sermon. That is such a great sermon. He says, learn the lesson that you cannot have gone too far from Christ. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Believe that your extremities are only extremities to you and not to him. The highest sin and the deepest despair together cannot baffle the power of Jesus. If you were between the very jaws of hell, Christ could snatch you forth. If your sins had brought you even to the gates of hell so that the flames flashed in your face if then you look to jesus he could save you he gives me chills if you were brought to him when you are at death's door yet still eternal mercy will receive you how is it that satan has the impudence to make men despair Surely it is a piece of his infernal imperatence that he dares to do it. Despair when you have an omnipotent God to deal with you? Despair when the precious blood of the Son of God is given for sinners? Despair when God delights in mercy? Despair when the silver bell rings? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Despair while life lasts, while mercy's gates stand wide open, while the heralds of mercy beckon you to come, even though your sins be as scarlet, for they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be white as snow. I say again, it is infernal imperatence that has dared to suggest the idea of despair to a sinner. Christ? Unable to save? Never can it be. Christ outdone by Satan and by sin? Impossible. A sinner with diseases too many for the great physician to heal? I tell you that if all the diseases of men were met in you, and all the sins of men were heaped on you, and blasphemy and murder and fornication and adultery, and every sin that is possible or imaginable, had been all been committed by you, yet the precious blood of Jesus Christ, God's dear Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If thou wilt but trust my Master, and he is worthy to be trusted and deserves thy confidence, if thou wilt but trust him, he will save thee even now. Thank you all for joining us for this March 2024 Bible study. I had to come back on and edit this last bit in because my camera failed me. <laughs> my recording device failed me for the live recording. We had a wonderful fellowship. We had a wonderful gathering together. 
And I am just so thankful and grateful to everyone who came, who spent their time with Zoe and I on a Sunday, and to each one of you out there who's listening to this tonight. Thank you so much for being here and for having such grace with me. I love all of you. God bless. Thank you.